Some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The Senate has narrowly rejected an effort to vastly expand conscience exemptions in President Obama's new birth control coverage rule. The mandate already allows exemptions for religiously affiliated institutions, but the so-called Blunt Amendment, sponsored by Republican Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri, would have let any U.S. employer deny contraceptive health coverage on religious or moral grounds. The measure failed in a 51-48 vote, largely along partisan lines. Maine Senator Olympia Snow was the only Republican to vote against the amendment. Respect to the Blunt Amendment, I think it's much broader than I could support. I think we should have focused on the issue of contraceptives and whether or not it should be included in a health insurance plan and what and what requirements there should be. That was Senator Olympia Snow, who has announced she will be retiring from the Senate. Uh, the Obama administration's mandate has spawned passionate debate over whether women should have free access to contraceptive care, either from their own employers or insurance companies. On Wednesday, Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney ignited a firestorm among his rank and file when he said he was against the Blunt Amendment. I'm not for the bill, but look, the idea of presidential candidates getting into questions about, about contraception uh, within, within a relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and wife, I, I'm, not, I'm not going there. After the interview, Romney's campaign quickly said he actually did support the amendment. That hasn't stopped Democrats and Republicans alike for blasting his comments. Republican presidential contender Rick Santorum told supporters at a rally in Georgia, quote, we saw an insight into what's in the gut of Governor Romney yesterday. In other reproductive rights news, a Virginia bill mandating ultrasound exams for women seeking abortions has cleared its final legislative hurdle and is expected to be signed into law by Governor Bob McDonnell. It includes an exemption for victims of incest and rape, provided they report their assault to police. Proponents of the bill argue ultrasounds will help inform women about the pregnancies they wish to abort. But critics contend patients will be subjected to emotional blackmail, logistical hurdles and legalized bullying. The Virginia ultrasound bill is just one of several measures around the nation. Texas already has an even stricter bill in its books, and Alabama Republicans would like their own vaginal ultrasound bill passed soon. For more, we're joined by two guests. Here in New York, Dr. Willie Parker is with us. He's a physician, an abortion provider, and board member of Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by Terry O'Neill, president of the National Organization for Women. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Terry O'Neill, let's begin with you. Talk about the Blunt Amendment. The Blunt Amendment is an anti-contraception, anti-birth control uh, provision that was actually made a lot broader. It simply says that any employer could strip any health care service from the employer's health care plan based on any undefined religious or moral conviction. It was clearly aimed, however, at birth control, and it would allow employers to strip birth control from, uh, from health plans. It's, it's, uh, it's clearly illegal. Courts have spoken very uh, specifically that, that uh, it's not, it, it is not okay under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to discriminate um, in in the provision of health care services in a health care plan. And this is clearly um, discrimination, um, uh, sex discrimination. So, so it's a, it, it's what's really surprising to me about the Blunt Amendment is that it did not fail 99 to 1. That should have been the vote. It's, it's, uh, it's appalling that politicians really think they can get away with restricting birth control. I mean, it's one thing for the Catholic bishops to rail against birth control. It's another thing for an elected official. Those elected officials, believe me, who voted for the Blunt Amendment will not be holding their jobs very much longer. And, and well, as you say, Catholic officials rail against it while 98 percent of Catholics use uh, uh, birth control. Uh, your sense of why this enormous, uh, uh, this close vote on an issue like this? Well, the Republican leadership seems to have decided that it's a, that that uh, attacking women's health 
is somehow politically a good idea, uh, they clearly need to divert attention away from the improving economic situation. That is not good for them politically. They're trying to paint President Obama as, as having failed on the economy. But, but I, I cannot explain, honestly, why the leadership believes that uh, attacking women's health is good for them. The, the polls show, you know, Rick Santorum was poised to win the Michigan primaries by a substantial margin. He lost women in droves because of his uh, anti-birth control stance. And believe me, Mitt Romney, who is clearly anti-birth control, who is very willing to enact laws restricting birth control, he is going to lose women uh, if he becomes the nominee in the general election. It was quite something to see the complete turnaround within a couple of hours of Mitt Romney, first saying, of course, he's for the amendment, and then that he was against the amendment. But I wanted to ask you, Terry O'Neill, about Rush Limbaugh, who uh, made headlines on Wednesday after calling a student reproductive rights activist a slut for campaigning in favor of contraception coverage for women. Limbaugh made the comment during a rant on his radio broadcast. What does it say? about the college co-ed Susan Fluke, who goes before a congressional committee and essentially says that she must be paid to have sex. What does that make her? It makes her a slut, right? It makes her a prostitute. She wants to be paid to have sex. She's having so much sex she can't afford the contraception. She wants you and me and the taxpayers to pay her to have sex. Limbaugh ratcheted up his rhetoric Thursday, saying the student, Sandra Fluke, should post an online sex video if taxpayers are forced to pay for contraception. So, Ms. Fluke, and the rest of you feminazis, here's the deal. If we are going to pay for your contraceptives and thus pay for you to have sex, we want something for it. And I'll tell you what it is. We want you to post the videos online so we can all watch. Sandra Fluke is a third-year law student and a member of the group Georgetown Law Students for Reproductive Justice. She was barred from testimony at an all-male panel on contraception on Capitol Hill last month. The day after she wasn't able to give testimony, Fluke appeared on Democracy Now! I strongly believe that our government has to legislate for reality, not ideology. So if we don't provide contraception coverage and health care, that's not going to stop anyone from having sex, whether they should or should not be. And we really have to take care of women's health care and, and not worry about policing their moral choices. That was third-year Georgetown Law student Sandra Fluck. Terry O'Neill, your response? You know, I first read Rush Limbaugh's comments before I uh, saw and heard them. And reading them, uh, my reaction was, this is this is the rant of a 12-year-old. I haven't seen—I actually haven't seen that kind of language since I was in junior high school. But when I then looked at it, I saw the video. Here is a grown man um, being extremely— um, uh, I, honestly, the sense that I got was it was more than bullying. It was really calling on his listeners to become belligerent uh, towards women. Um, it was calling on his listeners to, uh, to belligerently attack younger women who use birth control as sluts and prostitutes, um, as, as, as women. And, and, you know, we know that violence um, against women in the sex trade is, uh, is statistically much higher uh, than violence against women elsewhere. So it, it, was a, it was, frankly, the very dark undertones to this. I have called for Rush Limbaugh to be taken off the air as a result. Um, and, uh, and Sandra Fluke f is, is, frankly, my hero. Well, we're also joined by Dr. Willie Parker. Uh, you, uh, you were shaking your head as you were listening to that, uh, uh, to that Rush Limbaugh uh, rant. Could you—your uh, reaction to it? Well, as a women's health care provider, as a man, but more importantly, as a human being, I was just taken aback that he would feel empowered to use that kind of language to refer to someone who simply disagrees with his way of seeing the world. And I think if we have tolerance for that uh, under the guise that it's free speech, um, I, I think we're, we're on a slippery slope. If you can say anything you want, if you can injure with sticks and stones, you can also injure with words. And I had a great sense of shame as a man that he would use that language uh, at that uh, bright and courageous young woman. 
Dr. Parker, can you talk about the whole controversy in Virginia, um, this whole idea of uh, the first the, the vaginal ultrasound probe and then how that was changed to be just the ultrasound? But explain what is being legislated around this country. Start with Virginia. Well, what's being legislated is, in my opinion, an attempt to parse away at the uh, right to confidential legal access to abortion services for women, since there's no real option for overturning Roe. Uh, the goal is to parse it away such that in, in application it really has no role when women have barriers placed by rules that impede their access to abortion care or rules that are burdensome by forcing them to interact with information that does not improve their decision making. It really is an, under, it's an attempt to undermine the basic access to the health care that is abortion. And how would this ultrasound requirement work? Well, the, first of all, mandating rules by the government has no place in a doctor-patient relationship. That relationship is based on trust and confidentiality. I can't think of any other area in the 20 years that I've been practicing medicine where I've been forced by the government, someone who has no medical training or background, to use a particular test or to inform a patient about information. Uh, it, it violates the very notion of informed consent. Consent means that you have the option of receiving information or not, and this rule would require us to, it would force us to have patients or women to interact with information that we would use in a clinical sense for the purpose of the coercion. An early ultrasound, before 12, early, before 12 weeks, the main use of ultrasound is to accurately date the pregnancy and to establish that a woman has normal anatomy and maybe the number. Outside of that, it has no useful information that would inform a woman about making her decision. Women, when they have an ultrasound or when they prevent for abortion care, they already know that they're pregnant. The ultrasound is not going to improve on them knowing that and then making the decision about whether or not to continue a pregnancy. And the difference between the ultrasound and then originally what the Virginia law, um, the uh, law would have mandated, the probe, what are these different devices? Well, the vaginal probe is uh, a, an instrument used in ultrasound that allows the person doing the ultrasound to, by, in, by placing the probe inside, to get closer to the object that you want to view. So, for example, the vaginal probe allows the ultrasound transducer or part that collects the signal to be right next to the uterus so that you can get a clearer image with more information. That is most useful in extremely early stage of pregnancy. So, the information that you gather from a vaginal probe ultrasound doesn't give you any more information than what you would get at a six weeks transabdominal. And in fact, the main use for a vaginal probe ultrasound is to locate the pregnancy, to rule out the presence of an ectopic pregnancy, which is a life-threatening condition. But it does not provide additional information that allows a woman to determine whether or not she's going to uh, continue a pregnancy. And, and Terry O'Neill, the, uh, the implications of this uh, Virginia law in terms of uh, across the country uh, efforts, again, to uh, have the government intrude into the, the health, uh, women's own health care? Sure. And these, these ultrasound laws really are part of a coordinated campaign at the state level to produce what, what, what we are calling um, humiliation, ritual humiliation laws. The only purpose of these laws, they, they mandate medically unnecessary, non-consensual, extremely costly uh, procedures in, in which the, the, not only does the ultrasound have to be done, but the woman is forced to, uh, in some states, view the ultrasound, and the doctor is forced to tell the woman whether there's a heartbeat. And, and the, 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 uh, in Alabama, for example, Mr. Schofield, who, who, who introduced uh, an ultrasound law, actually said that he had taken the, uh, the, the transvaginal probe, uh, he, he, he made an exemption for that, so that a woman, he said, I want a woman to have a choice whether to have this ultrasound by a vaginal probe or externally. So, in other words, his choice, and he actually used that word uh, for the woman, is, shall I be humiliated with a vaginal probe or shall I be humiliated uh, with an external ultrasound? They're completely outrageous. And, and, and they really are part of, as, as, um, as uh, 
as the doctor said, they are part of this coordinated campaign to chip away at women's ability to access ordinary health care. One in three women will have an abortion in their lifetime, and it's, it's, a, it's a really common, necessary part of women's reproductive health care. But these laws are making it harder and harder for physicians to provide standard medical care because they are uh, uh, so hemmed in by all different kinds of, of requirements. And, Dr. Parker, the use of contraceptives for actual medical care, not to stop conception. But actually, when Sandra Fleck was on our show, the Georgetown law student, she talked about one of her friends at school who needed it to treat a condition. And because it, she wasn't able to get it, um, she ended up having a hysterectomy because she wasn't able to treat, um, what she, uh, at an early stage, what she needed to. Sure. Uh, we all the time in medicine use drugs or medications that come to market by FDA approval for a primary indication and then their secondary. The non-contraceptive benefits of co hormonal contraception um, are as prevalent and, and for many women as important as the ability to prevent an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy. For example, women who suffer serious and debilitating symptoms with their menstrual cycle or PMS as it's commonly known. Simply by being able to regulate her menstrual cycle, she can be relieved of debilitating symptoms and continue to be functional. The, the, the patient stories are the best ones, and I think what's at risk if we paint with a broad brush and lose the ability to have women have access to contraception pills uh, for non-contraceptive benefits, I think of a patient I had by the name of Ashley, 14-year-old prodigious soccer player in the ninth grade who, in the early part of her menstrual cycle, had very irregular periods and sometimes would bleed down to anemia. Her mother brought her in to see me um, to find out what we could do. And early, oftentimes, when women first start their menstrual cycles, they're very irregular. So Ashley, who was not sexually active, uh, wanted to have some way of not interrupting her ability to play soccer. So with in consultation with her mother and her, we figured out the best way to regulate her menses was to start her own birth control pills. Now, if Ashley's purse falls on the floor and her pills fall out, people will assume that she's sexually active. But there are other non-contraceptive benefits, and that's what would be lost if we paint with a broad brush and allow contraception to be politicized such that everyone uh, loses their access that should be able to use it. Well, we want to thank you both very much for being with us, Dr. Willie Parker, physician, abortion provider, board member of Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health, Ontario.